We are in Daniel, and you can turn in your Bibles to uh, Daniel chapter 6 is where we're at. Let's pray. God, help us to know that you are enough for us. Regardless what comes, regardless what we face, you are with us. Because of Jesus, because of the finished work on the cross, because our sins are washed away, because we are clothed in the perfect righteousness of your only son. We enjoy a relationship today with a God who is with us. Help us to draw today as we open your word. Help us to draw encouragement. Help us to draw sustenance from your word. We do not live by food alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth, O God. And this is your word breathed out to nourish our souls. So today we come hungry, hungry to know you better, hungry to deepen in our affection with you. Lord, speak to us through your word, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Daniel's confidence in his God was unshaken regardless of his circumstances. What he thought, what he felt, what he did was not contingent on what other people thought of him, expected from him, even what they plotted against him. Verse 10 says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, basically his death sentence, he went into his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Those who conspired against Daniel had planned well. They understood enough of the character of Daniel to know that he would remain committed to his God no matter what. They knew enough of the king to know that he could be taken by flattery. And their plan to get him to sign his name and then use his own words against him, it worked. They now had gained the upper hand. Their jealousy found vent. The king must carry out their desire to have their rival executed. Verse 16, then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him. And sleep fled from him. Daniel's fate and his tomb were sealed. The king was greatly distressed. But despite his best efforts. He could do nothing. To change the outcome. He was driven to his knees. Verse 19. Then at break of day the king arose. And went in haste. To the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. 
The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king's great distress turned into great gladness. The Lord was indeed able to deliver Daniel. My God sent his messenger. Jesus was present with Daniel in the den of lions. And Daniel came out unscathed. No kind of harm was found on him. I, I don't know how deep this pit into which he was thrown was, but you would think a man in his 80s, maybe so full of grit and gristle to be unappetizing to lions, would at least come away from that with a broken hip or ankle or something. No kind of harm was found on him. He was cast into the pit, but he had already cast himself fully on the Lord his God. He was quietly leaning into the Lord alone. And it was his Lord who delivered him. Verse 24. And the king commanded. <laughs> and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. This is a grisly scene. If there was any question if the lions were too tame or too old or too overfed to be interested in eating someone, what happens next removes all doubt. The other officials had thought that they had gained the upper hand. Even if their open manipulation of the king and the law to carry out their desires worked in disposing of Daniel, their jealousy had blinded them to the reality that their actions would cause the king never to trust them with anything ever again. You manipulate. And now you want to be ruler of my kingdom? Of course not. Their plan was carefully crafted, but they didn't think through the full implications of their actions. Jealousy blinds. Bitterness, anger, resentment blinds the eyes. They certainly didn't believe Daniel's God would actually deliver him <laughs> from the lions. There's a principle here that we find in Proverbs. Proverbs 26, verses 27 and 28 read this way. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. And a stone will come back on, the, on him who starts it rolling. A lying tongue hates its victims. And a flattering mouth works ruin. This is poetic justice at its best. The one who digs a pit will fall into it. The one who sets a trap for others will fall into that very trap that he has set. This principle is rooted in God's law against bearing false witness against others. This is exactly what Daniel's enemies did 
They bore false witness against him. Deuteronomy chapter 19 says, if a malicious, that word is used, malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, and if the witness is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is a big deal. To bear false witness in court, it was, there were no cameras, it was my word against yours. And to bear false witness, to condemn an innocent man, is wicked in the sight of the Lord. So the consequence was severe. What you meant, what you intended to do to your enemy, that happens to you. That's exactly what happens in this story. Jesus gives us the positive side of this teaching in Matthew 7. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you wish others would not do to you, don't do to them. God will bring about justice. You will reap what you sow. We see this principle throughout the Proverbs throughout the Psalms. Psalm 7 begins with a declaration of trust in God. O oh Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Not in the courts, not in the justice system. In you, O oh Lord, do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me lest like a lion they tear my soul apart. Rending it in pieces with none to deliver. He knows in whom his hope lies. The psalm concludes with a description of his adversaries and the outcome of their evil plans against him. Verse 14 of Psalm 7. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil, is pregnant with mischief, gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of Yahweh, the Lord Most High. That's Psalm 7. Psalm 57 begins the same way with a declaration of dependence on the Lord for protection. In you, my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. Selah. God will send out his steadfast love and faithfulness. Then he states the danger he is in. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. He goes on in verse 6. They set a net, net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way. But they have fallen into it themselves. He concludes with worship. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. See, there is poetic justice that God will bring about ultimately to his own glory. Those who dig a pit will fall into the hole that they have dug. Those who manipulate the king to destroy the blameless will be consumed by the very lions they expected to eat Daniel. God is just. And ultimately, God will bring about justice. Now, if we look at the structure of the book of Daniel, 
This Aramaic section, chapters 2 through 7, we see chapter 6 is the mirror of chapter 3. And there are so many instructive parallels between the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar and the lion's den of Darius. The background of both chapters is the elevation of captives from Judah to positions of authority, which creates jealousy among their peers. In chapter 3, it is the king himself in his pride who sets up his own image and demands that all bow down and pay allegiance. In chapter 6, it is the other officials who by subterfuge manipulate the king to pass a law that feeds his own ego that all would pay allegiance to him. Chapter 3, the danger is a sin of commission. The Command requires that they do something to commit adultery, uh, idolatry, by bowing down to the king's statue to worship a false god. In chapter 6, the danger is a sin of omission. Something regularly to be done is now forbidden. The three refused to bow. Daniel continued to give thanks to his God in prayer as he had always done. In chapter 3, the disobedience is public. Chapter 6, it's private. In both chapters, the rebellion is observed by the jealous opponents and they draw near to accuse them before the king. And the rebellion is framed as a personal attack against the king. They pay no attention to you, O king. Chapter 3, the king offers them another chance to bow. But they decline it. Chapter 6, the three times a day disobedience precludes the need for another test. Chapter 3, the king is furious at the insolence of the rebels and demands that the punishment be exaggerated. Chapter 6, the king is greatly distressed, seeks to find a way to rescue from the consequences of his own law, but he fails to do so. Chapter 3, the king issues a challenge. Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Chapter 6, the king expresses his hope. May your God deliver you. Chapter 3, the three believers confess their unshakable faith that God is able to deliver. But even if he does not, they will not be unfaithful to the Lord their God. Chapter 6, Daniel is silent. It is the king who offers the hope of deliverance by God. In both, the offenders are cast into a pit. In both, the Son of God is with them in that pit. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar observes the fourth man in the fire, invites the three to come out. In Daniel uh, chapter 6, Daniel gives testimony of the one who was with him in the pit. And the king orders him to be lifted out. In both, those who serve their God come out of the pit without the least bit of harm. And those around them are able to inspect them and to testify to the miraculous deliverance that God brought about. In chapter 3, the soldiers inadvertently die in the superheated furnace while obeying the king's orders. In chapter 6, those who conspired against Daniel are commanded by the king to be thrown to the lions. These two episodes are paired in the record of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11, who through faith stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire. What can we learn from this? God cares just as much about our private obedience as to our public devotion to Him. Private obedience, chapter 6. Public devotion, chapter 3. 
sins of omission, failing to do what we ought to do, failing to give him thanks, those are just as real as sins of commission. Worshiping false gods, doing something we know we ought not to do. Both were thrown into the pit. God does not always exempt us from suffering. But he is with his people when they go through trials for the sake of his name. He may not exempt us from suffering, but he will be with us through it. We learn from their example that this life is not all that there is. They knew that their obedience to God, even if it cost them their lives, would be worth it. Think about that. They knew obedience to the Lord, even if it meant death, would be worth it. They knew there was something more. As Hebrews puts it, Hebrews 11, 13, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, verse 16, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Whatever suffering we have to do, we have to endure is worth it. Both chapters end with an edict. Nebuchadnezzar blessed God and made a decree that no people, nation, or language should speak anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego under penalty of death. And he promoted them in the province of Babylon. Here in chapter 6, verse 25, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Throughout this ordeal, Darius begins to understand what God is like. Through this, through this trial of Daniel, Darius learns something about the one true God. He learned the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All people ought to tremble and fear before him. The fear of the Lord the beginning of wisdom. <clears throat> he learned that he is the life giver, the source and sustainer of all that exists. In him is life. And he is alive and he is active and he is at work in this world today. He learned that he is eternal. No beginning, no end. He is the unchangeable, uncaused cause. He learned that he is the ultimate king. And no one can conquer his kingdom. The kingdoms of this earth rise and fall, come and go. But his rule will go on forever. And not only is he the sovereign, eternal, living God, but he is Savior. He is the only one who can deliver, who can rescue. He can save his people from the power 
of the lions. He is a miracle worker. He does signs and wonders in heaven and on earth to draw attention not to the signs and wonders, but to himself. He is eternal king, and he is mighty to save. And he wants us to know him. Darius, like his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar, learned some good theology from believers in this God who simply lived out their faith in the face of suffering and death. Remember, it was not by random chance that God's people ended up exiles in Babylon. God sent them into exile. And God had multiple purposes for doing so. He was punishing their disobedience. But he was also sending them out on mission with good news for the nations. He chose them and blessed them so that they would be a blessing. And that in you all the nations would be blessed. You see, God has purpose in their circumstances. It might look like all hope is lost and I'm being thrown into a pit. God has purpose in your circumstances. What is your circumstance today? How might God be intending to use that that circumstance for His glory and to bring His good news to the nations. Let's pray. Father, Help us, like Darius, to look at the circumstance, the suffering that Daniel, that Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego went through. Help us to learn something about you. About who you are. That you are sovereign. That you are in absolute control of the universe that you spoke into existence. The kings and kingdoms, leaders of the world rise and fall, take territory and lose territory. And you are on your throne. And we do not need to fear. They may kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. Thank you, Jesus, that because of what you did on the cross, we are in your hand, and no one can snatch us from your hand. We are safe. even in the presence of our enemies. Because you are the living God. You are the eternal God. You are the almighty king. And you are mighty to save. And you love to save sinners like me. Once a rebel spitting in your face. Now belonging to you, your prized possession, treasured, loved. Jesus, what a miracle transformed by the Spirit of the living God. New creations in Christ. What a treasure to belong.
to you. To have purpose in you. Thank you for the good news that sets us free. Free from our circumstances. Free to worship you regardless of the cost. Help us not to keep this good news to ourselves. But to point every people group around the globe to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in your name we ask it. Amen. We're going to remember Jesus together, what he did for us. I'll invite some of the men to come to prepare to serve you. Bread and juice, simple things, simple reminders that Jesus laid down his life because that was the price that my sins deserve. The wages of sin is death. And I'm a sinner against a holy, righteous, and good God. And I deserve death. But what Jesus did on the cross is he took that sin on himself. His body was broken in my place. His blood was spilled as a sacrifice, a substitute for me, because that's what I deserve. His blood washes away our sins. And we are clean when we put our trust only and completely in Him. We have bread and juice, reminders of what He did for us. Reminders of the payment price that He paid at the cross to forgive a sinner like you, to forgive a sinner like me. I'd invite you to take bread and juice, hold those in your hand and reflect and worship on what Jesus did for you. We'll take it together once we've all been served. Jesus, we, we stand today accepted in your presence, in the presence of a holy and righteous and wrathful God whose wrath was turned away because it was poured out on you in our place. You became real human flesh and blood so that in that real, tangible, physical, human form, you could bear the wrath of God against my sin. And take the punishment that I deserve. that I could enjoy forgiveness and relationship with you forever. Thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you that you are mighty to save and you save in unexpected ways, not by military might, but by lower, lowering yourself, humbling yourself, and dying the death that I deserve. What amazing rescue, what amazing deliverance. What astounding salvation. Thank you, Jesus. We remember and we worship you. His body broken for you and taken eat. His 
blood poured out for you. Drink.